Hello and welcome back to the channel to another of my interviews. Today I'm going to be talking um, to two distinguished guests. You may remember we've talked quite a bit about uh, common law, natural law, all of those things and you may remember all of this was kicked off by a gentleman called William Keat when we were talking about constitution and the fact that a lot of people are unaware that we have a constitution or that it has the power that it does. And so many of you have said, can we have William back again? And so, of course, by popular demand, I said we can. But not only that, William has brought a colleague of his, John Locke from Australia, and we're going to find out about how this works across the Commonwealth rather than just in this one country. So let's bring them on. First of all, we've got William Keat, of course. Hello, Will. How are you? Very good. I'm, I'm in good form. Thank you very much, Richard. It's great to be back on. Fantastic. And we're going to go to the other side of the world, down to Australia, to John. Hello, John. Hello there, Richard. Thanks very much indeed for inviting me on. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be working with Will again. Uh, we've oh, been talking quite a bit recently. So. It's lovely to have two different perspectives on this. I, I must ask, the mountain that you are sitting behind there looks very, <laughs> it looks very lovely. Can you tell us where that is? Uh, yeah, that's just a look, the view from my, my patio at the back there. <laughs> no, uh, not really, I'm, jo I'm joking. But uh, it's just, um, I don't know where it is actually. It's just a, a, a scene I like. I have it as wallpaper on my PC and I thought it would look better than as a backdrop than the stove pipe and the, the light in the kitchen that's, at the real, that's really at the back of me. So. <laughs> You've blown the myth. You could have been somewhere, you know, up there in the Himalayas. I think, for I think your stove pipe and kitchen looks very nice, John, actually. I don't think you should. <laughs> anyway. So, so, I refer to it as Mount Olympus, anyway. Yeah. Mount Olympus, there, that, that will do. As long as, as, long as it's your stove pipe that's uh, producing all the smoke and not the mountain, we're all right. <laughs> anyway, so Will... Will, you've uh, you sort of very much uh, yeah. in control today. I'm just here to sort of make sure that you you two boys don't uh, cause too much trouble and get me banned again. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the Commonwealth and the Constitution within that, and then Article 61 from the Magna Carta. So, yes. Will, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, absolutely. By, by just 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 an introduction to John, really, mm. um, because both of these topics um, are. Uh, very, very much to do with the work that John is doing along with Fitz in Australia, um, and there are others also doing this. Um, and it's a, the, the, there are really two topics that, that we want to look at uh, today. Um, the first one is, is the Commonwealth countries and how they're affected by our common law constitution, because um, we haven't really touched on that enough. Um, and uh, so we'll start with that one. And, and, and the second topic is about Article 61. Um, which we need to go into, uh, which is the lawful rebellion uh, common law article. Um, it's, it's the it, one that everyone article. quotes, isn't it? You always hear them saying, oh, Article 61 this and Article 61 that. Yes. Uh, and but perhaps people don't really fully understand it. So it would be, that would be great to go into it. Yes. It, and, 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 it's, it's, and there's some complexity behind it too as well, which we'll come on to later. But, um, but absolutely. Um, and, and John's the expert on that and we'll, we'll go into that. But uh, yeah, the first topic, um, because John is in Australia, um, he deals with the, um, the, the the slight nuances that that we have to deal with with um, our our constitution as it relates to Commonwealth nations, and there's some little bit of added complexity there um, because of the extra fun and games that are played by the establishment in the respective countries as well. So, um, John, over to you. Get cracking. Go for it. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, uh, Will. Um, well, I suppose the first point to cover is really that the just to emphasise what Will's just pointed out, the British Constitution covers the entire Commonwealth. There are um, there are 64 countries who the, the Constitution applies to. These just a list of the 64 Commonwealth nations. <laughs> They're all able to uh, avail themselves of the provisions of Article 61. But as a bit of a sort of grounding, uh, we need to get a couple of principles out. First is that the, the Constitution is not the source of our rights. Uh, our rights are there from the time we're born. It is a written statement which binds the government. 
so that it may not breach those rights without acting unlawfully. That's an important distinction. Yes. Um, this, you know, we don't actually look to the Constitution as a provider of our rights. They exist from the moment we're born. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, but people I are bound by that, the common... Sorry. I was going to say, is, is that... I mean, because man has written the Constitution, that man then has to be above it. Because... Yes, it's, that's it's, right. It's, the, the, the key to it is that it, it, it's less a contract, because some people, I think, think of it as a contract. It's not a contract. It's a one-sided promise to bind the government. Mm. And the idea being that it leaves the people in their natural natural space, functioning under natural law, um, really as, as, as anarchists, essentially. It's an anarchist lifestyle for the people. Self-governing. Um, and the Constitution is only, only compels the government because it's a one-sided promise. So don't right. think of it as a contract, because it's one of the things that um, somebody that you were interviewing recently, um, I can't remember who it was, actually, was not understanding. I think it was Sovereign Pete. Yeah, I think, I think it yeah, was Yeah, one, one of those Pete. guys, and they're, they're all great great guys, and they're doing some good stuff, actually. Oh, yeah. But it's important to understand the Constitution doesn't bind the people so much. It's the government that it's binding. Right, binded. which makes so much more sense. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry, John, the, go on. The, go for it. The people are bound by the common or natural law, right, which is often referred to as God's law. That means it, it's, it's summed up by the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. In other words, we're free to do basically what we like as long as we don't hurt other people. Mm. Um, and the Constitution doesn't prescribe any action on the part of the subjects, the crown subject, it, only in one instance, and that is, we'll come back to it, is it, given in Article 61 when the monarch becomes charged with committing or failing to prevent treason. That's that's when that comes up. Right. So the basic moral principle of the Constitution is every living subject is a sovereign being. We have rights to liberty and self-sustenance that are born with it. Just the same manner and the same reason that animals or plants all have those rights. Every living thing has the, uh, the right to sustain and preserve its own life. Yeah. So I mean, there are people who... Sorry. No, I was just going to interrupt because somebody said to me the other day, it's funny how animals, you don't charge animals to live in their burrows and houses, but we get charged as humans yes. by our governments to live in yes. houses. And, and, and we're all equal, well, in our own species, but on the planet. I mean, we're all sharing it. So um, I was just sort of adding to John's point, really. Yes, but there are those who seek to prey on the efforts of others, right? And the worst offenders in this regard, uh, because they're granted a monopoly on the use of force, are governments, the groups that we call government. Mm. That's why there are constitutions to limit these, these these people. Most important of all, that's why constitutions cannot be written by the government. They must be written by the people and they bind the government. Spot on. Nice one, John. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and as, as <laughs> and I said, that makes so much sense. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's all, when you think about it, it's, it's very simple. Um, in Australia, though, the situation is complicated by the fact that there is a written constitution here, which some of the people are aware of. Actually, there's a huge number of Australians who aren't aware we have a constitution. Some of them say, well, isn't that an American thing? Uh, you know, they're just not aware that we have one. There's a growing number. Um, the problem with it is that it was established by the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act 1900, which is an act of the UK Parliament. Right. right? Uh, and that renders it invalid from the outset. Uh, <laughs> There were constitutional conventions held in Australia for a number of years during the late 19th century. And a submission was made to Queen Victoria to have the articles agreed upon incorporated into an Australian constitution. However, this was returned with over 70 alterations, which the people had not authorised. Right. This concept was sold to the Australian people um, with many materially relevant uh, facts and principles omitted in a referendum. Uh, but as we were aware, if you omit relevant facts when seeking an agreement, then that constitutes fraud and invalidates any mm. sort of contract or agreement. You can't just seek consent from someone to engage in a, a trade or whatever agreement you have. And you, if you withhold relevant facts, so this 
was something it, the average Australian in those days was uh, not aware of these, you know, the complications involved in constitutional law. An example of the fraud is shown in section 71, which grants sovereignty to the parliament of Australia to establish the High Court, which deals with constitutional matters. And it's, and quoting here, such other courts as it creates and in such other courts as it invests with federal jurisdiction. So this is despite the opening phrase of the document reading, we the people. Mm. Yes. The, the sovereignty is granted to the parliament. Now, only uh, people who are uneducated as to the true principles of constitutional or natural law would be could be persuaded to accept uh, such um, an overriding abasement of their inalienable rights. It's an open license, really, to establish legislative tyranny, mm. yep. which after 120 yep. years is now all but in place. Gradually, over the 120 years since that constitution was instituted, more and more power has accrued towards the federal government and the uh, the yeah. states have less yeah. they the states had a, a a big part to play in the recent um health scare that we're all aware of but this situation worsened in 1973 the whitlam government illegally sold the commonwealth of australia to the u.s securities and exchange commission as a business enterprise now there's so still a huge that, how does that work? in australia you... who are unaware of that how do you sell? So, so just say that again, so we get the full yeah. context. They of that. sold the Commonwealth of Australia to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission under a 1934 Act in the U.S. Right. And as right. a, a business enterprise. So, uh, if you look up Commonwealth of Australia, you're now it's a corporation. On, yes, it's there in the U.S. Exchange, and you've got it's got a it's got. A, the reference number and everything we we actually present this information to people in the notices that we provide them when we notify them that we're standing under article 61 and that they're acting unlawfully um now this was all done hush hush nobody was told about it um of course it gradually became became known to a few people but despite the fact that obviously government people must have known about it no succeeding governments have tried to rectify that situation um, they've only made it worse both parties have gone along with this and we've now reached a point where both the major political parties in australia have uh, policies which are virtually indistinguishable uh, which obviously makes a mockery of the idea that democracy is mm. all about by voting um so there's no legitimate constitutional process whereby the crown can become a corporation and presume jurisdiction over the people. Uh, under the constitution, as Will's explained it already, um, the people are all sovereign. Yes. The monarch yes. is just elected to perform the duty of protecting the individual's rights and liberties and the, um, what's the point I'm looking for? Uh, the stability of the nation, preventing it from, you know, foreign takeover yes. and that sort of thing. So um, the king, even the king doesn't have the right to capriciously command someone to do something that would violate their inalienable rights. If he did, they would also have an inalienable right to decline and uh, say, well, you're the first among equals, but you're not actually the boss. No. Your job no. is to make sure that nobody offends me. And that includes you. So yeah. that's putting it in a sort of a nutshell. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, an example would be one of the people you had on recently, Richard, uh, pointed out about, um, uh, for example, if McDonald's put leaflets through your letterbox saying, uh, look, from now on, we require you to spend um, $10 a week on McDonald's products. <laughs> and if you don't, there'll be a fine uh, yeah. or you're, you know, lock off your driveway so you can't go out until you've paid us some sort of penalty like that we we'll would just big, say we'll, we'll put a stinking great big mac on your driveway <laughs> yeah so uh, obviously we would just say to people well look uh sorry where's the authority where's your authority to do that yeah and it's the same with these people now that they're acting they're corporations acting every court every police um police force 
every government department in Australia is a corporation with a, a registered Australian business number. So does that so not there, limit no... what they can do? Does that, I mean, if they're a corporation and they're just putting, you know, say we, we want your taxes, uh, you've got no agreement, you've got no contract with them <coughs> to, to do that. So, as in, I mean, when people know that they are these corporations and that's how it operates... They, in theory, should be able to say, well, no, thank you very much. It's very kind of you to ask, demand some money from me, but I'm really not interested. But if you were a legitimate government who was here by the people to do the stuff, then, yeah, we would do. But exactly. you're not. Quite right. That's, yes. exactly what we, that's exactly what we say to them. Um, right. Now, of course, they don't like it when we say that. No, they I bet they to, don't. They try to harass, threaten uh, they do all sorts of things. Um, uh, I mean, it extends to virtually everything the government does. And especially the thing that gets most people, I suppose, is when we're punished for something that we've done, some infraction of a piece of legislation, that we haven't actually hurt anyone. For example, we might commit a minor traffic mm. infringement. Um, no harm is done, uh, but we get fined 150 or $300, whatever the penalty is um and when we when we say to these people we put them on notice we say look i'm standing under article 61 it was invoked in 2001 so it that suspended crown authority and unless you can prove that you've got crown authority and that uh, i'm mistaken that article 61 is not invoked then you know i will i'll willing to comply with your demand provided you can do that but if they can't do that because it was invoked so it gets to be a point where they start to to threaten and uh, harass people and it's the individuals always got the the option of complying under duress we explain to them look you i've ta i've sworn an oath to uphold the constitution which the current government is not doing i don't want to break that because that would be as far as i'm concerned committing an act of treason and but if you force me well i don't have much option it's it's on you mm. this will all be recorded and eventually when we get trialed by jury and proper courts established you will be summoned to one of those courts and have to answer for the things that you're doing which are crimes yes and so this is um, a process which when people first hear about it they think oh Gee, that sounds it's sort of a bit mind blowing, you know. Um, I first, the first person who was explaining to me about Article 61, which was the first contact I had with learning about the Constitution, I thought, well, is this person all there, you know? Um, <laughs> but when you learn more, maybe look into it, you find out, yes, it's all exactly as they say it, easily provable. Is yeah, one of the problems um, that, that the people who are employed by these corporations do not that you know the lower ranks of people do not know yes. that this situation is like that so you're sat standing there arguing the case and saying well actually you know you don't have the authority to do this by the way and they are so in with indoctrinated with how it all works and cannot even conceive that there could be another way of looking at this so presumably that's, right. that's half that, the problem it's an owl on the head yeah that's it. that's exactly the problem. The higher that, that, that is that is largely the case, and I would I, I would say, Richard, as I've said before, that they pulled this off largely through miseducation and gaslighting. Um, yes. You know the people within the system, uh, to 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 a varying extent, depending on their position and what sector and what department, what agency mm. of government we're talking about, uh, are knowledgeable or not to 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 varying amounts. And I would also say, and it's important to emphasise this actually that. There's a there's there's probably a bit of a difference, a bit of a contrast between what's going on here in the UK and in Australia. I think, um, John, you'll probably agree with me that I think that things are probably more contrasting out there in Australia um, in that uh, you are in a worse situation in that the that that contrast is is, is a little bit more obvious um, and that the behavior of government agencies is probably more shocking over there than it is mm. here. I think you've you've progressed further and slid down that 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 road of tyranny. Um, I think here we're a little bit protected by the rather um, sort of 
you know the middle england spirit you know that that frankly we don't we're not putting up with that sort of behavior we don't do that here it's not mm. polite it's not and actually it's surprising how effective <laughs> it's not cricket that is. it's just not, not cricket, cricket. And, it, and it's surprising yeah. actually how effective that is because mm. the people within our systems kind of still respect that sort of um fair play and that that sense of, of decency um and, and and i don't know john but may, maybe things have, have got a little bit more contrasted out there uh, do you want to talk about that at all Yes, I think because one of the one of the confusing things is, as I say, the existence of the written Australian constitution, because a great many people, when they see these things that we're talking about, this over overreaching the mark by the government, when they try to deal with it, they refer to the Australian constitution. And there were all sorts of different uh, approaches to that. There's all sorts of people running around. Some of them are in parliament uh, that refer to the constitution, of course, um, but there are others as well, uh, what you would call members of the freedom movement. And they propose various sort of uh, methods of dealing with this. But the problem is uh, the Australians have got more of a, the Australian government and their corporate bodies feel they've got more of uh, an independent hand because of the existence of this constitution and the fact that there was an act passed in 1986 called the uh, Australia Act that more or less declared Australia to be a, a sovereign independent nation, but doesn't really have any validity. And it was invalidated as well, along with all other acts and statutes when Article 61 was invoked. So a, a lot of people here refer to or quote from the 1688 Bill of Rights as a source of protection from government, but that's not really uh, all that viable. The Bill of Rights is, is treasonous for a number of reasons. The main one, being that it declared the denial of royal assent to be illegal yep. and insisted that the monarch become merely a figurehead. Indeed, yes. the coronation oath acts stipulates the monarch swear to govern the people according to the acts and statutes of parliament. Um, Absolutely correct. And this, and, and John, this is well an arrogation of parliament point. to supremacy. You know, it's nothing other than a usurpation of crown authority. Yeah. Yeah. It's a common mistake That's over obvious. here, John. You're absolutely right that, that the authority is given to the Bill of Rights. Uh, which is itself only a statute um, with an unsigned declaration uh, within it. But it was all, yes, very, um, uh, re- as I've said before on interviews, uh, don't don't look to the Bill of Rights and the Declaration as an authority to the Constitution. You've got to go further back to, to Magna Carta 1215. That's when they get worried and scared behind the scenes is when you know that and you're looking back further to the foundation um, the, or the founding. Or it's not really the foundation of our Constitution. Um, as John rightly said, you know, our constitution existed prior to that, but it's the last um, declaration. It's the last expression that's written um, and it's absolutely solid. So uh, sorry, I interrupted you, John, but it's great. Good no, point. No, that's fair enough. Um, no, thank you for that. Uh, so so that, that the Coronation Oath Act, as I say, is trying to get the monarch to swear to govern according to the acts and statutes of parliament and to her credit queen elizabeth ii omitted that phrase in her coronation oath and included correctly the phrase according to the laws and customs of their peoples referring to some of the commonwealth nations while she did so however that was as far as she went right and she never once denied royal assent to any of the treasonous acts of succeeding uk governments Mm. which granted increasing degrees of sovereignty over British and Commonwealth subjects to the EU. That was what triggered on March the 23rd, 2001, the invocation of Article 61 of Magna Carta. It was the the House of Lords, the barons there that were charged with protecting the constitution in the event that the monarch failed to do so, quite rightly pointed out, we can't have uh, the European, any foreign body coming in and assuming sovereignty over Britain. That is absolutely forbidden, not just under the constitution, but under various acts like the Act of Supremacy and so on. Um, So Article 61, we're sort of gradually moving towards that now. Uh, Effect was to constitutionally depose Queen Elizabeth and suspend Crown authority. And of course they decided, well, this is, you know, we we better keep this quiet. Let's keep quiet about this. Um, once you expose uh, a, a criminal's actions as criminal 
and I'm, I'm not <clears throat> openly stating the Queen was criminal, but the people who are running the government act in that way, um, they, they have to resort to audacity. Once you catch someone red-handed, mm. they can either say, oh, it's a fair cop, or no, no, it wasn't me. You know, I was somewhere else, uh, and I'm just going to carry on. I'm not guilty. Uh, and that, uh, they just become audacious, or they cop it. So they decided to become audacious mm. and just carry on as as before. So they seem to have their um, own version of what to do, isn't they? Just double down as soon as yeah, you catch them down, out. They it. reckon yeah, they'll just double the down, and, and and if everybody says this lie then eventually everybody will believe the lie or it'll be so big mm. and we've got so powerful that even though you know it's a lie, we're still going to do it because we've got all the, the police, the army and all these things. So, you know, you better keep quiet about it. Shall and I do a quick, um, the... sort of, shall I do, just do a very quick introduction on um, uh, Article, Article 61? Six... Just give yeah. you a quick background behind it first. Please quickly. do. So the Article 61 um, is one of the Articles of Common Law um, in our Constitution. Um, and it's it's one of the, the few, as John rightly says, it's one of the few articles that actually purports to compel the people. Now, it, it, it is actually compelling the people, but it's not doing something legislatively because what it's actually compelling the people to do is what they would already be compelled and expected to do under the under the universal natural law. OK, and that's why it can do it. Because remember, I was saying earlier that the Constitution, because it's not a contract, it's not really binding on people. Uh, so it, the, on, the only thing that it's compelling people to do is what they would be expected to do under natural law. Mm. And what that is, is that if effectively the government goes rogue, which is essentially what has happened, um, and that Article 61 is invoked, which just simply means it brings it to the table through some um, recognised uh, mechanics, uh, within the administration, um, then that's the point that sort of triggers the action, if you like, within the people that what you are supposed to do is to call out the lie. That's basically what it's essentially saying in principle. You are calling out the lie openly and and you are um, moving your allegiance, if you like, to um, the power that is then held under by the barons, which is the power of the constitution, the principles of the constitution, are then held by the barons because the crown has effectively delegitimized itself. That's essentially what is happening. Okay, and so the people are compelled to do that even under natural law because all you're really doing is calling out the lie and standing for truth. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really it, it, what it, it is at the principal level. It, you are standing for truth and you and you are expected to do it openly and you are expected to do it in some form, in some way, that is 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 open and not so much public, but it's it's an expression. It's a clear expression of your allegiance to truth. That's what it is. It's really quite deep, actually, in right. what it's doing. Now, what actually happened was it was invoked on the 23rd of March 2001, when 25 hereditary peers of the realm, that they started the process, four of those... Um, are then meant to petition the Queen, which is what they did. The Queen then replied through Sir Robin Javrin, Jan, Janvrin, I think it is, isn't it, John? Um, who was the Queen, Queen's secretary at the time. And that invocation of Article 61 was reported in the Telegraph. It's a real deal. It's the real right. thing. It actually right. happened. Yeah. Okay. And, and, re and, re things, and relatively recently. You know, and relatively recently. Yeah. And those things would not have happened if it was not the real deal, you wouldn't have got it in the telegraph and, and the Queen's personal secretary would not have responded. Now, so, uh, I just wanted to reintroduce um, what, what John is doing, because John's heavily involved in, in Australia with FITS um, on Article 61. But there was a, there, there's a key thing that I want to point out here, which is, in a sense, one of the reasons why I haven't raised it yet. Um, because Article 61 is kind of like the delivery mechanism or the wrapping by which you um, show your allegiance to the principles of the constitution. Now, it's my belief that you can't do that until you understand the substance of the constitution. Hence why back in, when did we start this madness? <laughs> back in February or whenever it was, 
I said that it was an education exercise first, because what is absolutely critical before you start taking any procedural actions on any of this under Article 61 or anything else for that matter, is you have to understand the substance of the Constitution. What are you fighting for? Mm. OK, and what we're fighting for is the sovereignty of the people. And the sovereignty of the people is gained through jury independence and trial by jury. Now, the problems that I've seen in the past is that, that, that there are many involved in the Article 61 movement who have not even understood what, what the Constitution's actually about. Right. Uh, and even I've even heard of people taking action under Article 61 who didn't even know we had a Constitution. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is interesting, given the fact that Article 61 is an article of our Constitution. But anyway, I, yes. I'm, I'm just, just pointing that out, you know. But this is a problem. OK, now, the, the, the wonderful thing that John and Fitz and others are doing um, over in Australia is that they are taking uh, or encouraging people to take action under Article 61. But they're doing it um, at the same time as teaching people the fundamentals of the Constitution and how it relates to natural law and our obligations in the universe, our obligations to truth. And that is absolutely paramount. There's no point in taking action under Article 61 unless you understand the substance. Yes. And so so the, the guys over there are doing some really great stuff. So um, over to so John. is that so that's my I mean the... that no no that that's brilliant and and is that because you said before that Australia is in a sort of worse plus at worst place because of the contrasting way the government have, have seemed to have been more so they've been pushed into finding a solution which is there in front of us it, through the sixty one but understanding the constitution and and that's something that we can learn over this side this hemisphere yes. uh, need to learn because. Um, we're in a, yes. a similar boat, but perhaps just a s little bit behind. So, John, maybe do... just down to that. I mean, John, you can you can answer. Yeah. That. Is it is it is it the kind of the crisis nature of it, it that's actually kind of got you guys moving a, a little faster than? But it's not to say that people aren't over here too. No, there are but also are here. people waking up more to it because of the circumstances you're in, John? I think so, and the, 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 I mean the all the restrictions and the, um, infringements of inalienable rights that came about during the uh, the, the pandemic era um, they really woke a lot of people up and they said hang on a sec you know mm. even if I've got to have this treatment otherwise I mean you know I lose my job I mean these are all sort of things that were going on over here and people were um, waking up to it it made it a lot easier for us to get some get the word out um, the the point that Will made that I want to amplify is that uh, when we see that it's the moral question, when we see any crime being committed, we have a moral obligation to speak out or act against it. If we see somebody abusing a child in the street or uh, committing a, an act of theft or something <laughs> like that, we're obliged morally to to say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, we're, we're protecting everybody's inalienable rights when we speak against one instance. So this is very important that we do this with the, with these government bodies, that we call them out and say, yeah. you know, look, you, you really can't carry on like this. Now, how do we do that? That's the question. Mm. Um, this is where we get back to David Robinson. And he was working with a lady called Elizabeth Beckett. They devised a series of lawful notices, which we send on a recorded basis. We send them by recorded mail uh, to alleged officers of government if they're making unlawful demands on us, or even before they do so, we can let them know, look, I'm standing under Article 61. So if you're thinking of it in the future, making some uh, demand on me, you're gonna have to verify that you've actually got the authority to do that. Um, these are these notices are worded so that they're discernible to those in the legal profession as being in accordance with their usual codes of uh, honourable behaviour. You know how they all talk in court, the, my learned friend, the, yes, you know, yeah. the honourable gentleman and so on. Um, <clears throat> they make a great show of that. So it was necessary to get these notices worded in such a way that they were, they were understandable to people coming from that sphere. 
but also brought the lawful aspect of what we're talking about, the Constitution, onto the same plane. Once you've got the lawful and the legal on the same plane, then the lawful can exert its authority over the legal right. because it always has the ultimate authority. Yeah. Anything can be declared legal by Parliament, but that doesn't make it lawful. Lawful things <clears throat> which are bound by natural law override everything else in the final analysis. So that's how we sort of start pushing back with this thing. We use these notices to let these people know. And we, the idea is we're letting them know, first of all, about Article 61. They, they get a full copy of it. They get all the evidence about the um, the failure of the government to uphold the Constitution and their, their, their inalienable rights. Um, and we give them an opportunity to, we say, look, I'm not being belligerent here. I'm willing to comply with your demand, provided you can show me that Article 61 is not in effect. Mm. And if you can do that, well, then I'll do what you say. But of course, they can't do that. So they normally ignore those things. And we give them another opportunity in this sort of the honorable code that uh, the legalese profession uses. Give them another opportunity to uh, respond. They normally fail to do so as well. And finally, that we would then say to them uh, a third time, well, look, you haven't actually rebutted uh, what I've said. So I'm going to have to assume that you're giving you know, tacit legal agreement with what I've said. Um, now, you know, eventually, obviously, we're making, I'm making a file of all of these proceedings. And if, if it winds up in a court of law, it won't be to your advantage, the fact that you haven't rebutted anything that I've said, which might which well be the standing same, in law. And yeah. that's the same process they do to us, isn't it? It's exactly what they do to us. That is what they do, yeah. Yeah, so if yeah. you don't rebut their demands and things... And, and, and say, well, whatever it is, then they're going to assume that you've complied. I do think, just, 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 to, just a caveat there, because under, under common law, the idea of making a statement and then them not rebutting it, all that's really doing is providing evidence. It's not binding like it is in, in law merchant or, um, or the admiralty or the commercial type, type law systems. Right. Uh, because okay. remember that usually a jury is involved. So... You know, if, if, if the police make a claim about a defendant um, and the jury are watching and the defendant doesn't really understand or doesn't doesn't respond and doesn't rebut it, you're not necessarily going to say, well, oh, hang on, that, that they didn't respond. So that it must be binding. It must be correct then. No, it doesn't quite work like that. But what, what John is saying is that it doesn't look very good if they don't rebut it. It's pretty damn good evidence. And the whole right. thing about the Because they've got the chance to do that and they just it. don't take it. Yes, they've got a chance to do yes. that. And what John's really saying is that the, 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 the procedure, uh, the notice procedure that he's putting in place, what it's the power of it is that it's providing evidence and of their, of their criminality. Right, and it's right. also providing evidence for your protection, perhaps later against some, um, some accusation that you, you haven't stood for what is right, um, you know. John, so when it's in, so you. so when it's in front of a, a jury, you're able sorry. to present that evidence that you've just mentioned and say, "Well, look, here's the evidence. We did ask them; yeah. they didn't say. We asked them a second time; they still didn't say. So we've said to them, well, as you haven't, we're going to assume it must be true.' And well, you, you agree with it anyway? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's 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 basically the nub of it. Now we continue on. There are a couple of other notices after that. One, the, the fourth one we send is to say, well, you haven't disagreed with anything I've said so far. They may have sent, they may have disagreed in a letter or some response. In which case, we rebut that. We always rebut any response that they might make that our claim is not correct. Um, the fourth notice would let them know, well, look, you've been advised that there is treason being committed, and you're actually a part of that. So this is notice is putting you on. It's letting you know that you're committing the crime of misprison of treason, which is concealment of treason. You are supposed to report this to the authorities yeah. that are dealing with it. Supposed to deal with it, but it might be the police. It could be a, a justice of the peace, whatever. Uh, if you don't do that, this is just another thing that you're doing, adding to your catalogue of crimes that we've already noted. Yeah. And the final one is just a notice to them. Just to stop what you're doing, stop harassing me. Uh, I'm standing within the law, 
And if you don't stop, I may have to take action against you at some time in the future, uh, maybe even before the trial, because you are committing a series of torts. They're committing many torts with these things. The, the tort of uh, trespass, a sort of uh, uh, assault, threatening people with something is assault, um, demanding money with menaces, fraud, you're pretending to be a crown agent when you're not, you know, misrepresentation. There's all sorts of things that we let them know about these in some of the letters we send them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is um, the method that we use. Now, everybody is not obliged to use that method. It was something that was devised by David Robinson and Elizabeth as a great help to people who, like myself, didn't come with any legal background. Uh, most people don't have any very little knowledge of uh, how the law works, um, even what the law is. Um, so this process, these, these notices help with that. And they also provide a record. Even with, when, we, when we send these, we even include those of us who have done a written oath. We include a copy of that to them to say that this, this is the oath that I've sworn. You can see this is, what I'm, this is where I'm standing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in accordance with the constitutional law as it was invoked. So can I just say, um, actually, that, that although um, and, and it's important uh, just to make the point that actually uh, Article 61 doesn't doesn't say how we should do this. But um, but but this is a very complete process. So what John is describing here is a series of notices um, that have that are perfect as a record, as I've already explained. Mm. And, and there are some impressive exhibit documents that are, are, are put in there as well. So one of those, for example, is the um, F FCO 30 slash 1048, um, which is a, um, a document that was uh, released. It was actually classified until relatively recently. I obtained a copy of it years ago at the time when I shouldn't have had it. Um, you rebel. You I rebel. Know. Um, but it's actually got, I mean, it contains some fairly jaw dropping stuff. And, and, and one of them is a um, is an interesting letter back from Lord Kilmuir, I think it is um, a, a letter back to the Heath government advising them of the, of the treason that we're, they would be committing if they went into the EEC. I mean, it, it's quite a, wow. amazing stuff, you know, and they did it anyway. And they did it yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's some important stuff here. So, I mean, you know, credit to these guys because they're and 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 to Dave Robinson, who I I did know for a short time. Um, I, I wished I'd known him for longer, actually. Um, but he did a lot of work. And the other thing, actually, just to say is that I will I will put a letter up as one of the resources on CommonLawConstitution.org that Elizabeth Beckett wrote to the Queen towards the end of her life calling her at her out on her unconstitutional reign. Uh, I'm sure John is, a, is aware of this one, um, but it's a fairly jaw dropping letter and it's written beautifully. Um, and, um, and, 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 and what that brings me on to is, is my own personal sort of favored style, because actually going with the notice process that John is talking about is great. I mean, it's full of good stuff. But I, I personally, stylistically, prefer a simpler, shorter, more principled kind of letter, a simpler process. Um, but that's only because that's just me. That's just what I'm like. Mm. Um, and remember that actually you're acting this in, in, um, in natural law. So it's about principles. You're not compelled to do it this way. But I do think that the documentation that these, these guys have put together is very complete. And if people want to do it that way absolutely fantastic um there's some really interesting stuff in it but as i say i will put that elizabeth beckett letter up as well carry on john sorry anything else you want to add no no <laughs> thanks uh, thanks will um so yes yeah, as, as you mentioned earlier uh, not long ago what we're really aiming at we we want to get trial by jury re in properly convened courts re-established and Article 61 is provi just providing us that that uh, doorway that we can open to start on that path. That could possibly be quite a tortuous path. Uh, we don't know how many twists and turns are going to be uh, have to be negotiated as we move towards that goal. But this enables us to start. And the more people that we can get who can uh, make their affirmation, um, to support the Constitution, however they want to do it. I mean, in the old days, it probably would have been a verbal, uh, yeah. since most people were illiterate in 1215. Mm. Um, 
or even today, for example, the people who are supposed to be constables, who are posing as constables, they swear their constables oath verbally on the day of their graduation. You know, um, then they forget about it. They, it's hard to find a police constable who's actually living up to that oath, where they actually swear to preserve the the king's peace and to treat everybody equally and not do anything to disturb anybody's peace. Um, where while they go busily about obeying these orders of their corporate masters and uh, hedging us about and pushing us into corners. Um, so for there to be a legitimate legal system, there must be a lawful basis on which it rests. You, know, yes. you can't have a legitimate legal system and we do need a legal system, right. but it must be based on, it must be lawfully based. If That's it's not, it's just a free for all. <clears throat> Whoever can get the biggest gang together, Yes. And that's basically what we've got at the moment. So can I, uh, let me ask you this then, which has just occurred to me. How do you take a corporation to a court? Because you're really only able to take the, a very good question. the people yeah, you're not, you're, who are you're so the employees. Much taking, you're not taking the court, the corporation to court. In a way, this whole business about what they've done yes. is setting up these parallel systems. As I keep saying, we can sort of know that that's what they've done. But it's not what we should be focusing on. What we should be focusing on is how they should be operating and then calling them out why they are not. You can say, as a subtext, I think you've been setting up corporations. I think you've been setting up parallel systems of government. No, but if I, I'm just saying, but, if, you've, if you've got the, if you, if you implement the trial by jury in front of 12 just men or however many it is, and it's run lawfully. Oh, I see. And Sorry. So you've got the corporation, which is something on paper. Yeah, but it but yes. on, only has employees. Yeah. So I'm asking. That's so, the answer. To, yeah. Yeah. So that's John, the answer to your question, Richard. Yes. We find out the name of somebody who's making the demand. CEO. We might get a demand from you know a, a fine from a council for parking, or it could be for some other fine or fee that they want to levy against us. We have to find out who is making that demand. It's got that to be individual. A Right, and then we and we send the notices to that person, and we point out it's on you. You are personally liable for what yes. you're doing. The yes. fact that you might have a badge, a gun, and a, a costume that makes you look like a police constable, yeah, uh, doesn't mean that you necessarily are a police constable. If you're not acting like one, well, you're not one. You're just right. pretending. Um, so it will be you personally that will be held liable in a court of a trial by jury at, when the time comes yes. and, it, it's, and and that whole thing about being obviously you can tell some law. of them don't get that idea but some of right. them do get it and they and they 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 backpedal they back yes. off because that thing about you know um being ignorant of the law is no excuse which is what they'll tell you but if you if they're an employee and they don't realize actually by mm -hmm. signing the document that we want the money from you for whatever it is you're saying to them, well, actually, you realise that you're liable and ignorance of the law is no yes. excuse, yeah. mate. Especially yes. now that I've told you. Yes. And, I mean, you really can only ignore something once you become aware of it, can't you? Yes. Otherwise, you can't be ignorant of something you've never heard of. No, because although that's how they it, treat you. you. Know it's there. Yes. But now that we've told them, well, then they're answerable. Absolutely. Same as we are answerable. You know, if we're told, you know, don't do that or you'll be breaking the law. I mean. So, so where do we go from here then? We've got we've got the situation that uh, both you know your country down in Australia and where we are, we have the tyranny of these um, governments behaving extremely badly. Um, how do what do we what what is the the next process? What do we do, John? Do you want to talk about distraining and distressing? Oh golly! <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, in Article sixty one. It points out that when uh, the barons finally take this action um, of uh, <clears throat> invoking the Article 61, that we are supposed to distrain and distress the crown. And actually, the wording says, uh, let's see what I've, I'll just, so I don't misquote. Hmm. Um, right, here we go. Uh, right. Let's assume that, okay, the, the 
The monarch has made no redress within 40 days, which is the time given to them to redress the matter. The four barons shall refer the matter to the 25, who may distrain upon an assailant in every way possible with the support of the whole community of the land by seizing our castles, lands, possessions, or anything else, save only our own person and those of the queen and our children. He's, the, he's using the royal we here, the monarch talking. Until they have secured such redress as they have determined upon, having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal obedience to us. So some of the uh, original supporters of Article 61 did go so far as to seize buildings. I think David Robinson did one uh, in um, somewhere in Somerset. Uh, he they seized, he, um, he, 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 he was involved in the, in, in the action in, in Glastonbury. In the taking of the town, that's right. And in fact, Blastenbury. Sandy Adams, who you 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 also interviewed, was was involved back then as well. I think. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't on the scene back then, so I don't remember it sadly. But I'd I'd love to have been there. But um, yes, they 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 now took we, the town hall under Article sixty one, and the police were very decent about it because they understood, I think, uh, what uh, was going on, and they explained it to them at the time, and they handed it back a few hours later. Partly right. because the poor janitor was was wanting to get home. To to, yes, I've heard, I've heard that. I just looked <laughs> up very quickly uh, the old meaning of distrain, just as as a matter of interest from Latin. According to this, it says to pull asunder, from uh, <laughs> yeah. to draw tight and strain. But uh, it's now to take or sell so, uh, property from seven. someone who owes you money or pay back their debt. Yes, but the main I, method that we use now is is to. Um, simply withhold funding from right them. if you try to seize buildings they're quite likely to get a you know a, yeah, a over, over violent reaction from the police uh, people will get arrested and that sort of thing we we simply let them know hey look we're just not going to fund you yeah um, you're demanding this payment you don't have any authority i'm acting under article 61 this is distraining and distressing and yeah. there, and there may no, be. No. I mean, to be fair, we're, John, we're told to do it under any way that we can that's lawful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, John, you're absolutely right. And fund, funding is great. And and but but actually, back to the to the property thing. And and um, you know, it won't be a case of distraining and distressing castles and things like that. Although that could be quite no. exciting. Um, but it, you know, <laughs> it might be things that are movable in 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 the sort of the twenty minute zone cities and things like that. You know, things that are blocking roads. Mm, you know, cameras got, and. Plant yeah, pots you've, and all absolutely. Of those. You've got two reasons for doing it, <laughs> which is, firstly, the principle of it that it's actually obstructing my free uh, movement anyway. Um, but secondly, we're going to do it under Article sixty one because we're authorised to do it under the Constitution, um, wow. because because you are illegitimate at the moment. So, right. so you see, this is this is the point about doing this kind of stuff is that you are you are morally supported in 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 doing what you're doing. Yes. For, for, for multiple reasons and for the reasons under the law as well. It's really so, powerful. So what, what clearly what we need is for Will and John to put together a simple one page, easy to read PDF that just puts the bullet points that so that people can start to do this. If they've got cam, you know, I'm thinking of the the cameras and the, all of that, and just say, look, actually, we're allowed to do this because of these reasons and the process that most people, you know, because people will listen to a video like this and and be thinking, wow, this is really good. Um, now, hang on a minute, what do I have to do again? Yeah. Because there's so much, there's so much to take in, isn't there? And and you can you can lose yourself down the wa the rabbit warren of all these types of videos, but. A, a piece of instructions that goes one. Yes, make but, this notice. Two, do oh, this. We have that well, yes, but, in but, place. But, but hang on, Richard. That's what we're guarding against. See, that's right. the key because other, otherwise, the problem is is that people just think, okay, what do I have to do? I just need to do that, 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 and that. Great, yeah. fantastic. I'm sorted. No, you need to understand at a fun fundamental level what you're protecting. You you cannot do this. No, but that would be part of your. But that would be part of your process, isn't it? If if the process is, you start here. You've got to yes. understand this, and these yes. are the basic tenets, and you understand that. It's only then when you've kind of ticked all the boxes and yeah, passed yeah. your your own personal test, and you go right. I've got it. I know why. 
we're doing it. I know the history bit behind it, and I know it's moralistically right. Yes. They don't have that, and and it and it's part of the natural law. Now we move on to the second bit, which is where we we can express that to them and say, you know, you don't have yeah. the right to do this, by the way. And then the third thing is, oh, as you haven't done anything against it, well, we're going to distrain and and whatever the distrain other distrain and term, distress and yes. distress. And your cameras are coming yes. down, thanks very much, or whatever it is. Your castles have gone. We're taking yeah. the door away of number ten. You yeah. can't you can't lock yourself behind there. But we have these points of contact, Richard, where uh, people can contact us. Um, I'll send you the links and so on. You can put them into the the mm. box before you um, publish. Um, and where they can come and get this sort of information. Uh, ask absolutely. Questions. Yeah. And, I uh, just I just know what viewers are like. Get this education process. This is what Fitz and I have been working on. Fitzroy's done a fantastic amount of work. He's he's the leading thing. I'm uh, I'm basically a wingman for him. You know. Um, <laughs> We have a Zoom meeting like this uh, every Tuesday. In fact, the one's already going on now, which Fitzroy is attending, um, where we've got a group of people who are involved in the movement and we talk to each other and help each other out with various things. We compose letters for each other. We uh, discover whatever else we can to yes. learn about the, the lawful process. So that the aim of that is to be able to get this information out to a yeah. lot of people. The uh, hardest the only... part, Richard, is, is yeah. so people have trouble getting their heads around the fact that there could be so much uh, crookedness, or so much criminality in what's going on. People just have trouble getting their head around that yeah. uh, because no, we've I all been taught get... all our life, oh, well, the government's there to look after you, yes. um, you know, the law's there to protect you and so on. Uh, to, to understand or to get... the in your mind actually it's completely the opposite right they're completely screwing us and uh, so um, in a way as, in a, as Bertrand de Jovenel said uh, a society of sheep must yeah. in time beget a government of wolves so yeah, sorry true so yeah no I was going to say so so let me just revise what I just said because that's a very interesting point in a way what you need is is the um the people who've got the knowledge in your groups almost setting up community conversations where people come in they listen and go through because like what we've done here but then at the end of it once they've understand you know they've had time to understand how powerful the indoctrination has been and slowly realize actually you know they can't do this they shouldn't be able to do this and you have to think differently about why they're doing this and then these are the steps that you take rather than perhaps just as I flippantly said is the instructions and away you go. Um, yes, correct. No, that's absolutely spot on, Richard. And, 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 and deep within that process, as John will know uh, only too well because of what they're, they're doing, is this, it, this self-reflective nature of the process, the fact that we are actually a part of this problem ourselves. Because, right. uh, because you know, when we, when we talk about natural law and we just throw that term out there, you know, um, and, and I haven't really had a chance yet to get into this material more deeply, which I'm going to be on commonlawconstitution.org. But it is about this self-reflective nature. It's about um, the, the, our relationship between truth and lies. Mm. OK, and often it's about um, the, the fact that that not doing something in defense of truth and and the need for calling out lies is absolutely as important and not doing it is committing a crime under universal natural law right and that's right. really profound and that's the kind of stuff that that you guys over there john are going into with 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 fits because that's the deeper level reflection that is needed it's not that surface process no because without that real real understanding you can't understand your sovereignty and reach the point of your non-compliance until you start to go through that facing your demons facing your prejudices, understanding your own relationship with lies and truth, mm. it, you know, and, and, and the, the, the tendency that we have to sort of exaggerate and justify and play down. And we're all lying to ourselves a, a lot of the time. And, and, and it's those things, it's those little lies that have ultimately contributed to us outsourcing huge portions of our lives that has then resulted in the government coming in and filling that void that we've left by not being strong 
and setting boundaries and being honest with ourselves, that's the thing that's contributed to the condition that we're in. Wow. And that's the kind of stuff that people need to get into underneath that underpins constitutional law. So it's not a quick one. <laughs> no, no, no. I appreciate that. Fascinating. Although we, we, we don't have a huge amount of time. <laughs> no, um, no, in, no, we it, don't. But once that process is started, it becomes conscious. Right. And it's the consciousness. And there's no turning back. There's no turning back. Once you wake up. Yes. It's the consciousness of it that is the healing aspect of it. Right. You don't have to do all the healing. You don't have to go through the whole journey, but you have to start it. And it's the recognition and the acknowledgement that we actually are a big part in what we've what we've put into into play here. So this you, is yeah. this is I mean this conversation that we've had here is sort of adds to what we've had before and and you could have the same conversation just nuanced differently and it would all help hopefully sink in because as we said before the do- indoctrination is so ingrained yes. that just exposing the truth shall we say is not enough you've got to think the truth well it, exposing the conspiracy right is is scratching the surface Okay. Exposing truth is quite unsettling and quite potentially dark in yes. some ways. Yes. And it and, and that journey that we all have to go through is that 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 exp- exploration of truth. That's really in a sense what it is. It's the discovery of natural law and understanding how we have to align ourselves with the universe. Yeah. And, but what and, a time and, to be doing it. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. well, now it, it doesn't is... take that long to 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 start that process. The effect right. could be massive. Yeah. If sufficient numbers of people started on that journey. Yes. No. And, and, and what I was I was I suppose what with John doing what he's doing and, and we've all gone through this very troubled time and we're all thinking, was it necessary? Was it overreach? Uh, yeah. Are we happy about it? And and it happened to the whole world all at yes. the same time, and and so therefore, what a great time to be looking inwardly at ourselves and common law, natural law, constitutions, and all of that. And yes. if the whole world is doing it now, this is such an amazing time to be doing it because it is. It, it's going to trickle out everywhere, which must get the That's other right. side slightly worried. We, we're it, it, we're sort of over time now. Um, can I just, is there anything else you wanted to add to any of this? John, anything else you uh, want to add? I would add? only say one thing, and that is, uh, as as Will's just put out, this is much, much more than about just getting out of a fine or not paying your electricity bill. Sure. It's all to do with the world that we actually create because of the way that we think and act every day. And that's what it's all about, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, and therefore much, it's Richard. not about it's not about just getting out of trouble. No, you exactly. Just John taking... said, it's not the firefighting. It's the it's the root cause. Yes, it's about taking that action when you're not in trouble. Right. That that's the key. Yeah. Brilliant work, gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, coming and 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 bringing this. And we must continue to do this um, every few months because I think people, it, you know, it just trickles in, they get a gleam of it and they think about it. And then another one just reminds them because we've all got so busy lives and we're trying to sort of fit all this lot in. It would be great. But meanwhile, John down under, good day there, down under. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, for, for uh, it must, what time is it where you are? We're recording this in the morning. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, uh, Quarter past six now, so uh, yeah, no worries, Cobber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, not too bad. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, so, thanks to John, and thank you, Will. Uh, Will and I will be sharing a panel at the Better Life Conference in June in Bath from the 1st to the 4th. Can't remember what day we're on. So uh, no doubt we'll be bringing this up there a little bit, t- talking yeah, about I was, that. I, I was hugely relieved to find out that, Richard, you were going to be on the panel with me. But, it's, it should be a laugh, shouldn't it? It should be brilliant. And we've got some great people on our panel. I'm so uh, honoured, yeah, actually. Andrew James, Bridgen. James Corbett, Andrew, Andrew Bridgen, 
Uh, and um, Catherine Austin Fitz as well, who who I actually haven't ever met. Actually, I'd no. love to meet her. Looking forward to that. I'm very worried about it because there's a lot of people there I've vaguely heard of or have I'll, not heard in, of and should have heard of. I'll introduce you to all of them, and yes, I'll give you the lowdown beforehand. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, get a bit self-indulgent there, but uh, thank you to John and to Will, and it's been an absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, discussion it's fantastic to find out what's going on on the other side of the world because we've all seen those pictures of how abusive the government has been to our fellow friends down below and that has just been awful um you just you know the last place i thought australia would be like that but there you are so john thank you so much will thanks a lot i will be back again uh, with another interview and another time so do join us again don't forget to check all the links will be in the description uh, but from all of us here, if you can find the off button, uh, bye-bye. <laughs>